A very good afternoon to everyone. The theme for this session is Capital Flows, Investing in the Region. And shedding light on this subject are our guests, Mr. Shahid Javed Warki, Dr. Eric D. Manis, Mr. Nasser Afaf, Mr. Christian Eigen Zuki. The panel chair for this session is Mr. Burki. Educated at Oxford University and at Harvard University, he's an economist who has served as vice president of the World Bank and caretaker finance minister of Pakistan. He has written extensively on economic development and on the political history of Pakistan. His areas of research are development economics in general and in specific, the development of China, Latin America, and South Asia. He's currently working on a monograph tentatively titled South Asia in the New World Order. Mr. Javed Burki will be, uh, Burki, sorry, will be uh, chairing this session, and I now invite him to please introduce our panelists. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thanks to those of you who were able to <coughs> leave behind the coffee and whatever and make it to the session. I've been asked to make it brief uh, since we have uh, a program in, in the late afternoon, early evening. <coughs> Uh, since we have a very limited time, I will not spend uh, too much time on introducing the speakers. Their bio data are available. Uh, two of the speakers are my former co colleagues from the World Bank, where I served for more than a quarter century. Both Eric Manis and Christian Eigen Zuchi are development economists and both have studied capital flows origi originating with the diaspora communities. The third speaker, Nasser Afaf, also happens to be my nephew and I'm a great admirer of his talent. I hope he will be able to show it that this is a deserved reputation. Uh, he has organized a firm of his own called Non-Linear in the United Kingdom. He will tell us about the problems he has had in bringing new financial instruments uh, to, the <coughs> uh, to the work that he and people such as him can do in the countries of their origin. Nasser lives in London. Since uh, I would like to get the audience interested in one aspect of capital flows from the diasporas to the countries of their origin, I will go straight into the subject of using diaspora finance for promoting regional development in South Asia. I don't need to go to any great extent about the difficulties the countries in the region have faced in coming together into some kind of regional arrangement. I told this story in a book I wrote for the institution, uh, for the Institute of South Asian Studies a couple of years ago. And my argument was that although there was a lot of bad blood amongst the countries in the region, the time had come to cast off the, that burden and to seriously begin to work together South Asia is the only region in the world which remains so poorly integrated. Uh, my view is, and that's the theme that we will develop uh, this afternoon, uh, that the enormous amount of uh, money that is now available with the diaspora can be put to good use. And I'm going to invite uh, one of the members uh, from the audience with whom I had a very interesting breakfast yesterday to tell us how uh, some kind of project finance instrument can be used in order to uh, get going some very complex inter-country 
projects. Uh, those that come to my mind, and there are several others, are the Bangladesh-India gas pipeline, the Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline. It used to be Iran-Pakistan and India pipeline, but then India opted out, and uh, uh, there is expectation that if uh, things get settled between Washington and Tehran, India may come back into this operation. Then there is uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, uh, the Tapi pipeline. Uh, it is being supported by the Asian Development Bank and a new development, which is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. I mention these mega projects uh, because I'm aware of the fact that uh, these will cost a lot of money. And since they cross borders, they will need special arrangements, uh, some kind of multilateral guarantees to get them going. And challenge, I think, uh, that the diaspora community has is uh, whether they can use their enormous resources in order to come together and provide uh, assistance that would uh, take the form of uh, providing finance for projects such as these. Uh, just let me mention a few numbers. Some numbers are, have been used uh, in the various sessions this morning just to illustrate a simple fact, which is uh, whereas the South Asian diaspora covers a wide range of uh, income earnings uh, uh, that is to be found amongst these people, uh, the diaspora that is present in North Africa in particular is extremely rich. Uh, the South Asian diaspora, they number something like uh, six million people. Their per capita income is about 20% higher than the per capita income of the United States. So that's about $360 billion. Their savings uh, rates are high. Saving rates are always high when it comes to migrant population. So they're saving something like uh, $100 uh, billion a year. Uh, a lot of this is being invested in uh, asset creation. Uh, I had, a couple of years ago at the time of the first convention, uh, used a figure of $1.3 trillion as an asset base of uh, the South Asian diaspora communities, and that for obvious reasons, is a source for permanent in income, and some of that could become available to, uh, to get going development in the countries of uh, the origins of diaspora, particularly uh, in financing the kinds of projects uh, I have indicated. With this very brief introduction, let me uh, call our first speaker, uh, Christian, to uh, make a presentation. He is going to set the theme, building on the numbers uh, uh, that his institution, the World Bank, has on various aspects of uh, uh, diaspora economic performance. And then he, he will be followed by, uh, <coughs> by Eric Menes, who will talk about the role that the government can play in uh, moving resources from diaspora to the countries of the origin, and finally, uh, Nasser Afar will tell us of his own experience in getting some innovative work done in the country of his origin, which is Pakistan. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, uh, thank you, Javed. Uh, it's <coughs> so glad to be here. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for uh, having us. Uh, as Javed uh, mentioned, I would just be um, sort of setting the stage a little bit uh, for what's to come with some of the data that we uh, have gathered at the at the bank and and also f uh, from other institutions. Um, maybe I should just go straight to the the main messages. Um, so the first thing I'd like to emphasize is something that uh, you've already been hearing much of uh, today, which is that the South Asian diaspora is 
very large and is making uh, major contributions to the development um, of South Asia. And remittances are sort of the channel that we talk about uh, the most, um, in part because we have some data there. Um, but I guess the, the, the deeper question really is, you know, are we getting, is South Asia getting as much out of uh, their diasporas, out of this asset, their diasporas, uh, as they could? And, uh, you know, this is the, the, the question that I had uh, posed to, to the finance minister. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether he really spoke to, um, to it in the way that we were thinking about. Um, and so just to, you know, Eric will say a few words about um, you know, the various hierarchies of uh, diaspora engagement um, that really, uh, in, you know, lead to a sort of a, a deeper commitment on the part of diasporas beyond just uh, sending money. So first, just on some of the, the data, um, the UN has come out with estimates. There's a lot of numbers floating around. Data is, uh, remains difficult on the subject. Um, so the UN has come out with uh, estimates of about 35 million uh, South Asians, uh, South Asian born uh, migrants living in other countries. Um, and, and migrants, uh, about 10 million of those have migrated within the South Asia region. So it's also a major phenomenon. Um, the largest corridor uh, in, the, in the global south is, in fact, uh, south-south is uh, in South Asia between Bangladesh and India, although this uh, particular data point seems to have uh, garnered a fair bit of uh, controversy um, and when it came out in, in mid-September. Um, this, is, this basic graph um, probably tells most of the story on, on resource flows um, and tries to put remittances in the context of uh, broader resource flows. This is the global picture, which really shows that remittances um, have been growing s steadily, um, even through the crisis years, and that they are larger than um, private debt and, and official development assistance, some three times as large uh, as we heard cited this morning, um, and a lot more stable than some of the other sources of finance. But when you then go to the same graph um, for South Asia, uh, you see that the <coughs> these trends are even more pronounced. Um, so remittances are really huge. Um, they're far larger than um, official development assistance, you know, perhaps 10 times, um, substantially larger than foreign direct investment and, um, and private debt and portfolio equity. Um, a big thing there is also just that the flows have been quite stable through the crisis, um, and it's, it's really a, a huge uh, part of the South Asia story. Um, in 2013, we estimate these remittances to have reached about 114 billion, but that really is just the recorded, officially recorded remittances. So um, surveys show that um, some 40 to 50 percent of migrants actually send um, you know, remittances back to their countries of origin using uh, informal channels. So it's likely to be um, much uh, larger than that. So these are, these are really sort of underestimates. Um, this graph just shows the, the various amounts. Um, I think the interesting thing here is, is the, uh, when you compare it, remittances as a share of GDP. So you can see that, uh, that you know, in Nepal, it, remittances are equivalent to about 25% of GDP, and uh, in Bangladesh, 12%, uh, Sri Lanka, 10%, so also um, huge uh, impact on, on these countries. They're <clears throat> putting them in, in broader context. Um, you know, you, when you compare them to several of the key sectors that you know, various countries in South Asia are known for, like IT exports in, in India, remittances are, uh, you know, are, are broadly equivalent. Um, they're a little higher in the first half of this year compared to um, IT exports. But even in other countries, like Bangladesh, it's two-thirds of garment exports. Nepal, you know, more than 10 times um, of uh, tourist receipts, um, and, and so on. And Pakistan, 
you know, they're more than ha equivalent to more than half of all uh, export earnings. So the remittances story is really a, a, a key part of the overall picture. And when you then look at it compared to uh, international reserves, it, it again, the story is quite stark. So there's you know, four countries in South Asia where it's almost equivalent to 100% of reserves. Um, so you know, small changes in remittance flows could have a big impact on, um, on, the, on the foreign exchange position and, and the balance payments position. Um, this was evident, I think, also uh, you know, over the summer. We've been get, hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence that remittances surged um, following the depreciation of the rupee. So it, there's sort of an interplay between um, remittance flows and, and uh, balance payments um, and, and the exchange rate. So the, you know, the lower exchange rate attracted more uh, remittances. But at the same time, those remittance flows also help stabilize uh, the balance of payments. Um, one thing that I wanted to touch on briefly, just because uh, it, it is such an important factor in determining remittance flows, uh, is the cost of making those remittances. And it's very much on the agenda of the G20. Uh, the World Bank has been uh, tracking these. Um, you can see on this graph that, uh, that South Asia is on the lower end of the spectrum at about 7%. Um, but you know, this is still quite high. And given the huge volumes uh, that, that flow, um, you know, reducing these costs by even a, a percentage point you know, makes a huge difference in terms of uh, you know, the no amount of money left in the pockets of uh, recipients. And within South Asia, the costs vary quite substantially. Um, I don't know if you can see from down there, but I mean, I I'll need to visit Little India to uh, you know, visit some of the money transfer operators to find out what's going on. But you can see that on the low end of the spectrum, um, you know, um, Singapore to Bangladesh is one of the least cost corridors. Um, but Singapore to Pakistan is one of the highest cost corridors at over 15%. So I'm not sure whether when, when Javid sends money home to to Pakistan, if he's paying 15%, um, I hope he's finding other other uh, channels. This is largely driven by um, you know exclusivity contracts, lack of competition, um, and sort of regulatory concerns like uh, you know, anti-money laundering and counterfinancing of terrorism. So this is all about um, these flows, remittance flows. But what about capital? Um, you know, remittance flows actually appear in the balance of payments above the line, um, and and are sort of are, are just transfers. Capital markets, you know, you know, so remittances can play a big role in um, facilitating access to international capital markets. But as Eric will de will describe in a little more detail, to actually get. Uh, diaspora engagement on the capital side is, requires a, 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 you know, a, a whole different uh, level. Um, just to give a sense of the potential, um, there's a lot of different numbers um, being used. Javed just cited some very large figures. Um, colleagues in the bank uh, did a study uh, in 2011 that um, you know, made estimates of the amount of savings that diasporas are holding uh, around the world. And you can see the South Asia, um, well, the, the different regions uh, are, are listed there. South Asia, the, the estimate is, you know, some $53 billion in savings. Um, and this is most definitely a, a low estimate. But the key question then becomes, how can you actually mobilize this and attract these savings to uh, South Asia, how do you get people to sort of put their skin in the game? And I guess we'll hear from uh, Matthew on, on that shortly. Um, one avenue that I just wanted to mention real quick is on diaspora bonds. Um, and this is an instrument that, uh, that, that we believe can have a big uh, impact. Um, it's been used in some contexts. India has had uh, had, had, a, had a very positive experience with it uh, some years ago um, with the rationale for the issuing countries being that you hope to get a, a lower yield and more stable source of funds um, and, and to diversify your funds. 
and for the investors uh, that you, uh, you know, that, that, that they're able to um, sort of make good on, on patriotism or their desire to, to do good or their emotional connections. Um, and, and if some of the income comes back in the local currency, uh, maybe this is less of an issue for diaspora that are already making uh, remittances. So there's it's been some, um, several countries have, have tried diaspora bonds, um, but it's still a relatively early, uh, uh, early in the game. And uh, it's, it's an area where the bank and others have been engaged to try and um, boost this particular type of uh, engagement for uh, diasporas. So I'll leave it at that. Um, overall, I, you know, I think much more can be done uh, on, the, on the policy level. The potential is huge. The re remittances are there, which shows this very strong connection between diasporas and their countries of origin. Um, I think there's a lot of scope to elevate the engagement of uh, diasporas uh, with their countries of origin. Uh, the capital flows will be a, a key part of that story. Um, and proactive policies uh, you know, by um, countries of origin you know, uh, should, should, be able, should bring, bring more from the diasporas, you know, make sure that uh, the countries of South Asia are getting the most uh, out of their diasporas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, this talk of remittances reminds me um, when I mentioned to my father, who is a second generation emigrant from Europe, about uh, the talk on remittances. He reminded me of a story of when he was six years old in 1935 and the talk in the household was how to get a refrigerator back to Europe. Uh, that took about two months for one refrigerator to be transferred back to Europe, and that was the remittance of those days just 75 years ago. So we've come a, quite a long way. Uh, my talk today will focus more on what the governments of the home countries can do to convert this remittance flow into something more for the country. Um, you've heard already today that the diaspora is, is a rapid and significant uh, asset, that the, the, the greater the stake, not the state, but the greater the stake that the diaspora have in their home country, the greater the welfare benefit for that country. The third message that we have today is that governments have a role Governments have a role in creating the conditions for the diaspora to take the greater stake, and that this role consists of both fundamental policies as well as proactive policies, because fundamental policies take time, and the, the diaspora has an advantage of being able to operate in less than optimal country conditions, so can be first movers in the country prior to fundamental policies being in place. I won't go through the numbers, you just went, heard a lot. I did think it was quite fascinating that even as remittances were struck by the global financial crisis overall, in South Asia they were not. And I think that's, that's actually a fascinating uh, point, which we'll come back to. Um, again, as Christian said, the cost is an issue, but I find that the variance around the cost of nine or 10 percent is not all that great. So the discussion about the cost of remittances is somewhat limited compared to the potential of what the diaspora can do for its home country. And what we've done here is we've tried to formulate a so-called hierarchy of diaspora commitment. Oh, up the hierarchy means more economic welfare and for each level of the hierarchy, there's a public policy that can help facilitate. So very quickly, at the lowest level, you have people leaving. The next level is that people leave and put back money for consumption. This is the basic remittance flow. At another level, 
this money that comes back can start a business for the people receiving the money, and this creates more commitment of those people into the, into the country's stake. They're paying taxes, they're involved in the, econo in the uh, economic system. The next level is uh, trading in goods, then trading in services, providing knowledge, and finally investing. And at each level, I'll talk about a, a policy uh, framework for this. So level one is quite obvious. People leave for various reasons. Um, this is the well-known brain drain of skilled labor leaving. The public policy response here is just to try to create conditions such that they don't leave, but to stay in contact. So you have nine and almost 10 billion per month coming into South Asia. So this clearly boosts consumption. But while remittances certainly have added to uh, um, poverty reduction, it's unlikely that remittances in themselves will have a major development impact for the country. So the question is how to do that. At the next level, the idea would be for these remittances to find their way into the startup of a small business. And the policy program here is really the whole doing business program, the doing business agenda. For small business, get the regulations down, give access to resources, make sure that uh, firms can start up when they want. And the bank, the World Bank and the IFC have gone through a whole program of trying to measure that called the doing business uh, indexes to, to rank countries according to this level. There can be also proactive policies of the government in this area, and that is really one of providing space, incubation, mentorship, and the like. The next level, which is quite interesting, in, uh, in the research to prepare for this conference, I found that there is quite a bit of uh, empirical evidence that countries which have migrant flows actually trade with each other more though than gravity models would, would uh, uh, predict. And this is not surprising because, you know, the, the diaspora has, are bilingual, they can work in two uh, uh, countries, and they can create these linkages, which, is the, which would be the start of goods flow. Of course, the issue here is make trade easier. And we've heard a lot today about how difficult it is to engage in foreign trade in the region, both from the tariff, the non-tariff barrier, logistics costs, but there's also an, a possibility for a proactive uh, uh, support by the government to make, do some direct export promotion, find out where the diaspora are, and try to provide information to the, to the traders. The next level um, is in services. And this is actually quite interesting because what we find now is there's a whole, uh, especially because of the, the internet, there's a whole um, trade in services across the internet which may show up as remittance flows. You have now something called internet um, contract, uh, contract, ICT based contracting where um, actually, civil engineering, translation, small jobs are, are passed out to people in their homes, and they do this homes, and then they transfer that over the internet. The payments often come through, and they show up as remittances. But what governments can do here is there's also the, the concept of having um, the bankers, lawyers, and the like um, move across countries. So here we talk about people flow, but we really talk about connectivity in, in terms of the internet. The sixth level um, is one where, and we've heard a lot about that today as well, is one where um, there's knowledge provided through uh, membership on boards, through advisors to government, through <clears throat> different uh, types of uh, uh, teaching positions where the foreign um, diaspora can bring their expertise to the country. But here, what we often have is we need, oops, sorry, 
we need to have public policy which leads to good corporate governance because that's the only way that foreigners from the outside can come have an impact. And finally, um, the investing. Now, investing here is more than foreign direct investment, but let me just mention, it's a kind of a well-known fact that between 1985 and 2000, in China, 70% of the foreign direct investment was made by, by overseas Chinese. So that shows you the power of in, diaspora in, in investing, both on the, on, the, on the portfolio side, but also in the foreign direct investment side. Christian talked about uh, proactive policies to try to boost investment, and there is a couple of these. One, it mentioned a diaspora bond, and that's the case where the bond is used to finance perhaps a project, a school, <clears throat> a, a water system, and the uh, diaspora in small amounts uh, contribute to it. This is one of those proactive policies that governments can uh, engage in. So just to sum up, what you have for governments is a policy agenda to attract the diaspora, both on the fundamental side, but also on a proactive side. Very quickly, safety and opportunity to keep them at home, uh, supporting community to, to provide this ability of the remittances to have an impact, the small business agenda, uh, trade openness, people flow and connectivity, good corporate governance, and markets that allow for investment. And we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more, than that, more on that. But I also want to mention the, the proactive policies which governments can get involved in that will uh, help to smooth the road while the fundamental policies are being put in place. I'll leave that with the takeaways. I think I made them at the beginning, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me here to speak, and also specifically Mr. Berkey. I'm going to speak from personal experience, um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, going to be more informal. Um, and I also believe, um, certainly in my approach, that every, everything should be looked at in its specific context, but as you go along, you learn some, you form some general impressions. Uh, Mr. Berkey talked about some of the problems um, certainly I've encountered and others may encounter, but again, problems to my mind are only problems if you do not feel you have the confidence to resolve them. Um, so certainly there are challenges that need to be overcome, but I don't think there are problems given the opportunities. Uh, I've sort of come into this accidentally. I was with a large European institution where um, a very bold decision was taken by the board to outsource a project to India. Uh, it happened to be a business I was running. Um, and you know, it had its politics as well. But that was my first, first involvement, and it was a company in Bangalore. And um, I would say, despite some hiccups, the general impression was favorable, and I was very glad that it, it, it sort of went there. And I think, I think the institution was as well. But this goes back about sort of mid, mid 2000s. Um, and that was good experience. But interestingly, um, in the earlier um, talks today, we heard the word, you know, sort of fractious nature of geopolitics in, those, in that region. And I would like to comment on that. So the first thing is somebody mentioned that on the trading floors here, you see, and I, I worked on the trading floor in my life, or my, most of my working life, there was no issue between different nationalities. And that was certainly the case. I mean, for one of the largest banks that you probably read about in the paper and where I worked. Um, a very senior individual is the captain of the cricket team. I played for the cricket team as well, the Indians and Pakistanis and Sri Lankans. Uh, we all got along very well, and sometimes you could say that the Indians and Pakistanis got along better than Pakistanis, especially if a Pakistani happened to drop a catch of a Pakistani bowler. So we had, we had no issues. And in my first experience with this project with Bangalore, it was really a pleasure to deal, um, to deal with, you know, the, with the um, skilled staff that we were uh, interacting with on a daily basis. Um, what I was delighted as well was there was an insatiable curiosity to learn. And in the end, when you sort of distinguish 
I mean, nobody starts out with perfect knowledge, but their desire to learn and enter a new area was very interesting. So you knew that uh, this was the start of a good relationship. Now, a few years later, I, I went independent. I decided that I would do something independently. This was a few years ago. And this question of fractious, you know, the nature of the relationship affected me directly. My first port of entry naturally was going to be India. Uh, I had um, some interesting uh, backing from some very large institutions. And I wanted to go back straight away to Bangalore. And guess what? I realized it would be very difficult with the cumbersome visa requirements for me to make any headway there. I simply didn't have the time to deal with that stuff. So an investment opportunity that naturally, I mean, I, I don't draw borders. I don't care about that. You know, they were really, they were, that was a challenge I didn't want to take. So anyway, I went to the other side of the border, and I would like to share some general impressions I've come away with. Um, so there are two sides to it. There's the local side, the actual sort of where the investment happens, and I'm a very small-scale investor. And on the other side, where who are the people making the investment? Now, I think somebody else will speak about institutional investment and institutional processes and the right instruments. And we also heard from a distinguished finance minister earlier today. Um, but I will say that living three decades abroad as a South Asian, Intellectual capital is really, apart from investment capital, one of the biggest assets that the South Asians have. So from engineering or information technology in the Silicon Valley, uh, you know, health, financial industries, media, there are highly accomplished South Asians in all walks of life. And if they're in the middle of the action, they're really very well qualified to tell you where the next opportunities will arise. Um, they may not be very high net worth individuals, as you know, the ones who make the papers, but they may be people who have done relatively well, and they have fantastic ideas, but do they have anywhere to go? Um, yesterday, one of my ex-colleagues, who's Indian, actually mentioned that a large American company, I believe he said Hewlett Packard, gets more patent applications from India than out of the US. So the South Asian mind is also a very inventive one as well. And the diaspora outside has fantastic ideas. So from my own investment, the question that arises, and it's a question as much for you as for me, how do we channel that intellectual investment and back that with actual monetary investment to realize the potential that is sitting there? Um, a lot of these people are good at what they do simply because they focus on the job. So a good cardiologist who has some idea about catheters or something is not a person who is in touch with venture capital firms. So we need to go and create those instruments and those vehicles and those processes by which this diaspora can come forward. Um, so that's quickly my impression on the investment side. On the local side, um, yes, there will be challenges. The challenges are ultimately you, you know, they're questions of professionalism. Uh, I'm not saying anyone's unprofessional, but there may be different expectations as the different ground realities, but those are surmountable. Um, but, you know, infrastructure is an issue as well. Infrastructure and also poverty, because as a company, while you may have high standards and expectations of your of, of staff there, you will find that quite often there are challenges that they face that you may not appreciate. You know, it may be power, it may be water, it may be health. You may provide as much as you can. You may provide them with first class offices and even some, some, but their families may be affected. And that brings down productivity. So when you look at countries like Singapore, or I mean, Korea is a superb example with, with their companies, there's a, you cannot produce consistently the level of excellence that really makes you, you know, stand out. And for me, excellence is, is the one word that really matters because you can, have, you can go after low hanging fruit and you know we can have lots of web development and lots of little cottage industries. But I think a lot more can be done at a much higher level. And to do that, you need to, you need to chase excellence. And once you are associated with excellence, investment comes anyway. But to create that excellence, we have to identify the right ideas. And I, I said a lot of this comes from the South Asian diaspora. We need to tap into that. We have to find the right investment vehicles and instruments as well. And again, I believe there'll be somebody else speaking on that. But also at the local level, 
uh, some level of infrastructure investment must go on. You cannot expect somebody, let's say, I mean, now in, in outside Delhi, there's Gurgaon, there's Bangalore, but you cannot expect consistently the level of performance that some of the other ASEAN countries have shown or are beginning to show. So those are my, my general impressions. Um, a lot, in my experience, is being done, especially in Pakistan, um, you know, companies with 30 to 50 employees. But really, there's a lot more out there for the taking if the resources are pooled together. So that's uh, pretty much my, my personal experience. And I would like to pass it back to Mr. Berkey. Well, we've had uh, <clears throat> three very different presentations. Uh, we know that there is an enormous amount of resources lying outside with the community of diasporas. Uh, we've been told that uh, there are expenses in getting this money back uh, to the countries of uh, origin, countries from where these people come. Uh, we've also been told that uh, government policy has not always been supportive, but could be supportive of increasing the flow from uh, the places where these people live and uh, to go to the places from where they come. Uh, and then we he heard uh, something about personal experiences, frustrations, hopes uh, of an individual investor uh, when an attempt is made to set up something new in the hope of uh, both uh, benefiting the investor as well as the be benefiting the country from where, it, uh, where the investor comes. Uh, I happen to believe that there is an enormous resource sitting over there outside South Asia, which is available for uh, being invested in the countries of South Asia, the countries from where uh, 35 to 50 million people uh, have come and have built uh, fairly significant fortunes in the places where they live. Uh, the question then is, how can we uh, smooth out this process? Uh, just one uh, personal reflection before I ask uh, one of our audiences, a member of our audience, to come over here, Dr. Mattu, and tell us whether uh, there is some substance in relying on project finance type of vehicle to do some of the complicated projects. Uh, when I started working on China for the World Bank, uh, there was not a great deal of money going into China. Uh, that was in 1987. Uh, I then undertook to introduce uh, the Chinese diaspora to China. I met with some of the well-known uh, Chinese industrialists who had left their country a long time ago and had made uh, very large fortunes uh, in various countries in which the diasporas were quite active. And uh, to my gratification, to the gratification of the World Bank, uh, when these people bought the China story that we were telling them, not only did they come back, they came back with a lot of very new ideas. Uh, there was uh, a gentleman who owned a computer company called Wang Computers. He was operating from Boston, and I persuaded him to go back to China and set up shop in China. I met with some of the large... Uh, uh, business people of Chinese origin uh, working in Hong Kong, uh, and we were able to persuade them to come to the province of Guangdong and build roads and uh, uh, other types of connectivity uh, linking China with the world outside. And once these people took initiatives in a country that was considered to be uh, difficult uh, to do business with, other investors came in. They found that if uh, their own people were not afraid to go back to their country, then there was an opportunity. So uh, 
the subject that we are trying to handle is a complex subject, but my view is uh, that there is a lot of uh, uh, gain to be made by the investors and also by the countries from where they come from. Uh, could I then ask uh, Dr. Mattu to come over here and tell us whether there is uh, a possibility of using a project finance vehicle to, uh, to do uh, some of the large complex projects that I mentioned in the, f in the first part of my presentation? Mr. Chairman, distinguished uh, members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm personally grateful to Mr. Berkey for this opportunity. <clears throat> uh, I, I know this is unplanned, but uh, I have a, 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 a perspective. I know this conference is about the diaspora uh, and how the diaspora can help South Asia essentially to grow economically. I believe for the first time since the end of the World War II, that's essentially in our lifetime for most of us here in this hall, never have the stars aligned in a way from which South Asia in particular can derive the greatest benefit. And I can tell you on authority, the stars were not aligned this way for China. And the proposition is very simple. West, Western economies, for the first time in the last 60 years, are faced with economic prospects, and with that, the investment prospects, which are so vastly different from the economic and investment prospects that emerging markets, emerging countries provide generally, but South Asia provides in particular. So this is an opportunity. So while we talk about attracting diaspora money into the region, obviously you don't have to induce that. The governments don't have to induce that. We know, anecdotally we know, I'm not privy to the precise data that you know, uh, World Bank might have, but we know anecdotally people send money back to their home. We know anecdotally what happens to that money. That is, most of it is used for consumption. A lot of it goes into speculative investments, whether that is in equity markets or that is in property uh, markets. But frankly, these are the economies, especially India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, Maldives, are at a stage of development where you need to have the greatest bang for the buck in terms of we need to basically attract the kind of investment that creates the greatest impact for growth and the growth trajectory. And therein lies the opportunity. The good news is money in the West and parts of Asia, especially Japan, is institutionalized. What that simply means is, again, over the last 50 years, post-World War II, savings have become institutionalized. Most of the money that common people save in the West goes into pension funds, goes into uh, 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 insurance companies, goes into uh, uh, specialized investment management companies, and a lot of the investment decisions are made at this level. So why has the region not been able to, in fact, we heard from uh, uh, one of the panelists just now that uh, uh, the amount of money, of the amount of investment, foreign direct investment, or of the amount of money that went into China by way of investments, you know, just to make the distinction between remittances and uh, foreign direct investment, uh, uh, two thirds of that was diaspora money. Now, obviously, that has done wonders for China. And if we think about uh, roughly the numbers in 2012 of the roughly $1.4 trillion uh, that went into various parts of the world by way of foreign direct investment, uh, China uh, it, it attracts the biggest chunk. I think it's of the order of uh, $250 billion 
uh, or so, maybe even more, United States being the second one. For a South Asia to attract the money outside of the diaspora's pool of uh, savings, I believe the key lies in attracting this institutional money. So we know that on average, the GDP growth of China, almost 50% of that consistently came from investments. And when we consider that possibly the non diaspora money that went into China was of the order of uh, 25%. And that impact was pretty phenomenal on Chinese economic development. We can only imagine the impact if we were to attract in the current conditions where Western institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, and other uh, savings uh, institutions are finding it difficult to find investment opportunities that deliver long-term returns that they require to meet their uh, obligations, the opportunity lies here. So what do we need to do to attract that money? Now, I know from personal experience, you know, I have been uh, pitching to pension funds and insurance companies for a long time as part of investment banking, as part of fund management. It's not, it's not an impossible task, but one of the key reasons why institutions, Western institutions, don't invest in India or don't invest in Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka is the perceived lack of governance. So governance standards are deemed to be poor. Now, the problem really is, and this is where, this is where, where the vicious cycle is. If we were to attract institutional money into these countries, now, that money will only come on the basis of certain institutional standards, institutionalized standards. Three minutes. If we were to attract that money, what it will do, it becomes, from, from being a vicious cycle of not being able to attract this money, it becomes a virtuous cycle. Certainly, the standards of corporate governance improve because the money comes with strings, and the strings in the main, other than obviously the investment opportunity, whether that is uh, infrastructure or something else, comes with the string of corporate governance attached. So bingo, what it does, it improves corporate governance standards, which attracts more capital from these institutions. In order to get that virtuous cycle going, and this is, this is, this is what I was uh, discussing with Mr. Berkey yesterday, is what the stakeholders in these countries, be those the governments, be those uh, 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 supranational institutions, you know, financial institutions like World Bank, is to guide, to push in a direction where we create the necessary infrastructure that creates that mechanism of risk reduction for institutions which begins to attract money and then comes with, of course, with the corporate governance related strings attached, and that becomes the virtuous cycle of improving corporate governance because you're forced to. And that is the way to attract institutional money outside of the diaspora remittances, which magnifies, or obviously by definition, this is long-term capital, seeking long-term returns, and therefore absolutely and perfectly uh, right for the kind of investments we are talking about, which is long-term infrastructure projects. And that's what it is. So I actually hope something comes out of this whereby institutions you know, like World Bank and possibly you know, uh, 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 some, some, some uh, institutions in Singapore help us go in that direction. Thank you very much. Well, the organizers tell me that there is uh, no time left for questions and answers. Uh, if you have any, then perhaps uh, you could talk to the speakers outside the room. This room is needed for another session. Let me conclude the session by thanking all the speakers. They have uh, dealt with a very complicated subject in a uh, brief period of time and has uh, brought a great deal of information that is very useful to form some judgments as to the financial role that the community of diasporas can play in developing the countries from which they come. 
Let me thank the audience for listening to us. Sorry we can't uh, engage you in this conversation. Perhaps we could do it outside this room. Thanks a lot.